Thank you very much. And thank you for accepting my paper here. You might regret afterwards. We'll see. Um, the reason I should just say that the reason why I've, the title is put it like this is that um, there are certain places in, in the world where we see that cultures have um, interacted <coughs> strongly. We can't see from out there. There we only see the border between land and water. We don't see the borders between people, we don't, nor do we see the connections between people. But uh, there are places where people have interacted very intensively through history. Um, and these are places that can sometimes be very creative, very productive, very innovative, very propulsive. And other times they can collapse into conflict. <coughs> so um, these are places that could, for instance, be the Balkans. It could be the Caucasus. It could be the Levant. It could be East Africa or the Bay of Bengal. And there are certainly others. <coughs> All of these areas were until recently part of, or maybe heavily influenced by empires. If we take a look at, of, of, the, of the map back at 1700 AD, uh, we can see the, that most of the Eastern Hemisphere is ruled by empires. Um, the only major parts which are not is Africa south of Sahara, and it's the inner part of the uh, Eurasian continent. And then it is the westernmost part of, of, uh, of that same continent, where was what we would call um, Western Europe and uh, Central Europe. Um, a characteristic of those empires was a different raison d'etat than the one which characterizes a um, nation state. Um, so that cultural and religious and ethnic heterogeneity was uh, fully con compatible with most of these empires. They lived from absorbing different cultures and uh, sometimes played them cynically against one another, but basically containing them, basically being able to um, manage their coexistence, their cohabitation, as long as they were... <coughs> loyal to the imperial rule. And out of this cultural cohabitation rose both a very rich repertoire of shared mixed cultures, um, material as well as immaterial. Think of food uh, in Lebanon or Turkey or many other places. Uh, it's very rich, it's very mixed. India is another good example. And think of architecture. It's extremely mixed. Uh, and of course, also the demography was characteristic by an ethnic patchwork of settlements. I can <coughs> illustrate that with this map. This is a map which was um, uh, brought to the peace negotiations that followed the First World War. The First World War brought, as you probably know, the collapse of several empires. The Ottoman, the Austro-Hungarian, the Russian, which was transformed, it morphed into the Soviet Empire. But anyway, it, they collapsed. Um, <coughs> and um, if you look at this map, that was brought by a, a German delegation to the peace negotiations in, in, uh, in Versailles. And uh, what is evident from them is um, that if you look to the western part of, of, uh, of Europe, you see that the distribution of colors is sort of fairly clear. It's not muddled. But once you go into Middle Europa, into Central Europe, and further east, the colors begin to blur. They begin to sort of flow together. You have little dots of, of, uh, of different colors mixing up. You have scratches and things. So these territories are the territories of the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire in, in Europe. Um, and um, they are much more blurred. So that was the place where people lived together uh, with different uh, identities, religions, and languages, and so on and so forth. In the western part of Europe, 
you might think uh, that, okay, their people were sort of, for some odd reason, they were homogenous, and they were sort of perhaps more smart people or whatever. No, they were not. They, they had done their ethnic cleansing hundreds of years before. So that's, a, that's one basic difference. Uh, think of the Spanish, thank you, the Spanish uh, expulsion of the, of the, of the Jews or, or, or forced uh, um, Christianization or the, the Muslims. Uh, and the, the French getting rid of the Huguenots and uh, suppressing the, the Bretons and so on and so forth. Okay, um, so in areas such as the Balkans, we see a shift in configuration through times of empires that have competed for the same territories with the borders rolling to and fro and with uh, populations being pushed around and shifting and being also used sort of in the power play of the empires to um, compete with each other for privileges. So it has been a divided rule, both within the empire and between the empires. That has created an enormous mix of religions, of language and um, and uh, uh, immaterial culture, of course, uh, as well as, as uh, physical culture, as architecture. If we look to what happened with the breakdown of one of these great empires, the Ottoman Empire, um, this is um, the, the, the top row of pictures. That's, from, that's about uh, Salonika, as it was called in the Ottoman Empire, which became Saloniki. Under the when the Greeks uh, conquered and, 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 and uh, took over that part of the Ottoman Empire and claimed it for Greekness. Um, if you look at the at the um, at the picture from the left, uh, you will see a, a, a group a family outside the, outside the house the house, and you may wonder what are they? They look very Turkish, don't they? But they were not Turkish. They were, they were Jews, Jewish inhabitants. It was one of the greatest Jewish cities in in Europe by then, by the beginning of the, of the 20th century. In the middle, you see a man who was born in, Thess in Thessaloniki or Salonika, uh, Kemal Atatürk, the founder of the modern Turkish Republic. And on the right, you see the graph, which shows how the, um, the demography changed from being a mixture of, of, of uh, Jews, Turks, and Greeks. It became only Greek. The Jewish story ended with the Second World War, as you may imagine. On the bottom line, we have uh, Smyrna, which was a, a city which was Greek for a long time, and Jewish and Armenian. It became also in the same period, it became just a, a more or less a pure Turkish city. Right. Um, what was that? Was it right? Yeah. Okay. With the um, implosion of the um, Ottoman Empire, all these minorities didn't just disappear. They are still around. And, um, and I show you these pictures just to show you that uh, after the empire, there's a diversity. On the bottom row, you see uh, a Kurdish family, and you see the father, and uh, one of the sons, they're making this sign, which is the sign for PKK, Turkish independence. And, um, and in the middle, on the bottom, you see uh, three men. You can't see who they are, but they are Armenians. Armenian survivors in the Mush region of, of the eastern part of, of uh, Turkey. And um, they are uh, they're inside that behind the facade. And uh, on the facade, it says, it says um, uh, the Armenian uh, uh, social and touristic organization for, for, uh, for Mush which is a local town. So that's, the Armenians are, are coming back, sort of. They have been there all the time, but they've, they've survived, but they've been hiding their identities, and now they're daring to show it again, which is a great thing. On top, you see the, uh, some of the de demonstrations in, uh, around the Gezi Park in 2013. A man who's using uh, immaterial cultural heritage to manifest the insistence of keeping this democratic sp space in the midst of Istanbul, which Gezi Park is. Um, and he's wearing a gas mask because it was necessary in those days. Um, in the center, you see on the uh, front seat on the right, it's an Armenian expert traveling together with me in uh, Turkey to discover Armenian herders there. At the same time, lots of military outside, 
because the Syrian war is raging on the other side of the border and there's a lot of tension with Kurdish people being killed by Turkish military. So there are a lot of issues still in the post-imperial situation. On top right, a young um, girl on a school excursion uh, using her mobile phone camera to take pictures of the um, uh, wall paintings in an old Armenian church. She is obviously from a dress, a Muslim, but deeply occupied with learning about these uh, uh, Christian pictures. Right. Lebanization, you could imagine a, a future uh, for places uh, perhaps closer to here. Uh, you can go to Lebanon and study what happens when uh, things are splitting up in different identi identity territories. And um, here we are passing in Beirut from one territory which is ruled by, by uh, gangsters <clears throat> into another territory which is ruled by, by um, um, Hezbollah. Um, and when you travel through Lebanon, through Beirut and, and, and around the country, you will all the time meet these shifting territories controlled by different identities. And that's when you have broken down the ability to talk together, to understand together, to share heritage with each other, to share culture with each other in mutual respect. And then you have this territorial fragmentation. You can compete with your buildings who has got the tallest minaret or belfry. Uh, on the left side is, is a Saudi sponsored, sponsored mosque. On the right side it's, it's, um, it's a Christian church, um, Maronite church, uh, with an equal high belfry. So these have been restored after the civil war to compete who has the biggest one. <coughs> if you go to East Africa, we have the slave trade there and um, that has brought the slave trade and ivory trade had brought together people of different cultures uh, from the inland of Africa with people living on the on the eastern coast of Africa. And um, today, um, the Swahili language uh, is a mixture of Bantu, which is spoken widely in Africa, but with 30% um, mix of uh, words adapted from from Iranian and Arab languages. Um, the slave trade was cruel. Slaves were shipped from the mainland of, of East Africa to Zanzibar, to the slave market there, in Stonetown. But when you look at Stonetown today, where the slave markets were, it's a beautiful city. It's a World Heritage site. Um, and if you look to some of the, of the architectures there, you will see a mixture of, of elements from all over the Indian Ocean. Arab, Iranian, African, uh, subcontinental mixing together. The tomb on the right hand um, is, um, is a Muslim burial and it is um, it's a burial that has, um, uh, you see there's some hol hollow um, marks in that that used to be Chinese porcelain burials imported and being high status. They were used so, so mark that you were something special. If you had, could afford to put something like that in your, the wall of your house or your tomb, you were someone special. Hybridity uh, was celebrated in food and in architecture and music and everything. So um, I think I'll just go swiftly past that um, and go to the Rohingyans. Um, There's a city in the northern part of, of uh, Myanmar called uh, Mrau. It used to be a central of a small empire on the Bay of Bengal, and there people mixed uh, uh, Muslims, Hindu, um, um, Bengalis with the uh, people uh, of of, um, of, um, of, of um, Burmese origin or Rakhine origin. So there were Buddhist and, and and Hindus and Muslims living together. Today. Um, that small empire has been destroyed and it's, it's a place where also uh, the, the uh, Rohingyan tragedy is taking place. Now uh, UNESCO, on the advice of, of the recently deceased um, former uh, President, uh, General Secretary General of the, of the United Nations, want to make now um, a heritage site. The Chinese are deeply involved 
The question is now, will that be a heritage site that marks diversity, celebrates the Muslim culture as well as the Buddhist and the Hindu culture, or will it be edited and become only uh, an expression of the, of the Buddhist part? Everywhere you, in, in Myanmar, you will see mixtures of different cultures, and uh, it's very important to stress that quality. This is Anglo-Indian architecture with a Burmese touch. I could talk more about that, but I don't think I should because my time is running out. I just want to say, to finish with this, and say that, uh, say that what you see is what you think you see. This is a picture I took in 2014 in the Mush region, in, um, in eastern Anatolia. I was together with some Armenians. We were visiting a Kurdish village where we found some remains of earlier Armenian settlement. And this young girl, carrying her much younger sister, met us. And the Armenians said, ah, this is from Maria. <laughs> and that was what they saw. They didn't see two sisters. They saw the Holy Virgin and, uh, and Jesus. And um, so you perceive things that, according to how you have been sort of raised and, and conditioned by your culture, the important thing is to see hybridities and mixes and recognize them. Once you start to edit and say, our identity is just one, we have never received anything from anywhere, anyone else, we've just created it all, then it's heritage becoming dangerous. And it's heritage being abused for political purposes, which uh, are extremely unhealthy and which we see too much of today. Thank you. Thank you.